Hello, everybody. Welcome to Leftology. Today, I have on guest uh, Matthew McManus. Is that correct? McManus. Ah, I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, but right. would you like to um, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Well, thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and just my bio, really quickly, is I teach at the University of Calgary in the Department of Sociology, and I've written a few different books, uh, mostly on the topic of postmodern conservatism and arguing for a kind of liberal socialism. And people can check those out. Most of them are published either with Zero Books or Palgrave Macmillan. It's a pretty good catalog, um, so yeah. far at least. Uh, yeah, but uh, today I brought you on because you have a recent piece in Jacobin that I thought, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm interested in because I'm, I'm a particular big fan of critical race theory. Um, but you're discussing James Lindsay's new book, what is it, Race Marxism? Yeah, uh, race Marxism, um, which is kind of a sequel to his uh, earlier co-authored book, Cynical Theories, uh, which was frankly a much better book, but there you <laughs> go. So Race Marxism, The Truth About Critical Race Theory and Practice by James Lindsay. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've mentioned this in previous podcasts. I think I've talked about him in two episodes so far. And both time I mentioned that I'm not willing to spend money on him to be able to read his books. Um, so I imagine you've come in here and I've already read his books, right? Uh, yep. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I read over the Mart race Marxism one a couple of weeks ago, I guess, whenever it came out. Uh, one of the reasons is I was really just offended uh, by some of his kind of caricatures of critical race theory and Marxism uh, and a lot else besides on Twitter. And so when I found out he had a new text that was coming out, I thought, boy, this is going to be a great chance to kind of read it and try to figure out if there's any intellectual substance beneath all these kinds of nettling. And sadly, uh, my worst assumptions were proven correct. And there's not a ton of intellectual substance behind this. Yeah. There's more than in some conservative books that I've read. Yeah, I'll give you, them that. I, I remember you mentioning that in the article about how it, it switches from um, conservatives not reading anything and saying too much to conservatives reading a bunch and saying absolutely nothing. Yeah, a good way to contrast it would be to somebody like Jordan Peterson, right? So Peterson back in 2019, um, you know, I've written about him also, got into a lot of trouble uh, when Slavoj Zizek and a bunch of other people just asked him flat out, like, who are these postmodern neo-Marxists that you claim to have read uh, and that you hate so much? And he wasn't able to answer that. Uh, and then he was in trouble again recently because he had a bit of a meltdown on Twitter where he started citing things like Wikipedia uh, as a resource in some of these Didn't things. Didn't he like just list a bunch of like random philosophers and sociologists from the late 20th century in a recent tweet? Yeah, for the most part. Uh, I mean, there are a few modern ones. I think EVM Kagendi was in there. Uh, Foucault appeared twice. So there yeah, I remember that part. That was that was particularly funny. Uh, yeah. But I can't be a representative for the left, but I would personally like to thank you for taking one for the team and reading those books. Cause hey, th thanks, dude. I mean, honestly, that's a lot of what I end up doing. <laughs> um, so that was kind of also the other thing. When I saw that he had a new book coming out, I thought, well, this is my job, you know, better get to it. Yeah, I don't read many far, I don't read any far right texts. I think the furthest right I have on my shelf is either Nietzsche or Heidegger. So <laughs> that's about as far as I'll go. Um, but and James Lindsay is a very peculiar character. You've, uh, You've seen his Twitter and you've you've read his book now. Do you think uh, and this is a particular question that I have? Uh, he's coming from a math background. Do you feel like this affects how he comes to these sociological and philosophical concepts at all? Yeah, I think so to a certain extent. Uh, now, first off, I want to point out that uh, I'm not making any kind of beef with mathematicians. Uh, you know, my brother-in-law is a particle physicist. Uh, one of my good friends is a mathematician, right? Yeah. And uh, mathematics, you know, is an extraordinary discipline that has its place uh, and that if people can become technically proficient in it, then they absolutely should. Yeah, I couldn't uh, get any further than calculus too. All, all respect to those people. Uh, very fair enough, you know. Uh, but anyway, one of the things that you can kind of see in this book is this tendency for pattern recognition uh, that you might associate with somebody like a mathematician, right? Uh, in the sense that the book doesn't really build an argument in the way that you typically would in the social sciences or the humanities. Uh, and it certainly doesn't really set out to refute any of these people in a way that would be familiar to the reader of like a social science journal. Uh, what it does is instead say things like A led to B, which branched off into C and D, but then reconstituted as E and then and so on, right, over a long period of time. Uh, and as I pointed out in my review, one of the kind of frustrating things about this book is you read it and 
you get a bad history uh, of critical theory generally and critical race theory in particular. I, it's not horrible. I've seen worse. I have. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it's pretty bad. Yeah, there's some uh, bad ones out there. Yeah, yeah, there really are. Uh, but there's absolutely no real argumentation in the text, except for a couple scattered comments here and there. Because the assumption just seems to be that, well, what I'm describing is so on the surface a bit bad that there's really no need for me to refute it in any way, shape, or form, just to kind of diss it or dig at it. And my response is no. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think that this is just on the face of it wrong. I don't agree with everything every critical race theorist says. I don't agree with everything every Marxist says. I don't agree with everything um, that, you know, I say sometimes, you know, I'll change my mind on things. Uh, we can't just sit there and be like, look at how ridiculous this is. Nobody should believe in that. Yeah, the, the I way, need a lot more than that. The way you described it in the article, it, uh, I guess I, I come from a philosophical background, if you don't know, but it almost seemed as if James Lindsay was kind of treating critical race theory and Marxism as if they were a priori evils. And you're just kind of to assume that they that they're bad just by name alone. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And I mean, I gave a couple of examples of this type of rhetorical trope throughout the book, right? Where I'll dismiss things as paranoid conspiracy theories, right? That was a big one, uh, kind of an ironic one as well. Um, or I'll sit there and you'll describe something as just being paranoid uh, or shocking uh, or consisting of mind reading or even just call it ridiculous. Um, and, you know, you can keep on insult after insult after insult. Uh, and mathematicians know that zero times zero will always equal zero, right? Uh, and if you don't make any kind of arguments, no matter how many insults you keep on to a given tradition, uh, it doesn't deflate it really all that much. Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for this is I'm very skeptical that this book was pitched at a general audience, uh, partly because of the publisher and also partly because of the tone, right? Uh, this very clearly seems to be aimed at an audience that's already sympathetic to most of what James Lindsay has to say, and that's just going to look to see their opinions uh, and preconceptions be vindicated uh, with a little bit of intellectual gloss thrown in to legitimate the project. Yeah, I, I, th I think you brought American Marxism by Mark Levin as the kind of prime example of this genre. Um, I mean, I've seen that at Barnes and Noble, but can you explain like what that book is as well? Uh, so I have a review of that coming out at some point. Um, <laughs> with Dr. Ben Burgess, uh, but uh, okay. So Mark Levin uh, published this book, American Marxism. Uh, it was widely kind of lampooned on the left because uh, he made comments about things like the Franklin School uh, of Critical Theory. Frankfurt? Franklin is the way he characterized it. Right? Oh, oh, he just had it completely wrong? <laughs> yeah, this was oh in an God. interview he gave. Um, and actually, oddly enough, that mistake appears in the book as well, where he refers at several points to the Franklin School of uh, Critical Theory, right? And this isn't self-published, is it? Uh, no, uh, oddly enough, it was actually a New York Times bestseller. Uh, so, you know, it was a behemoth. So he um, went through editors and they didn't check that at all? That's what I'm kind of baffled at myself. Oh my God. Because yes, this was a pretty easy mistake to fix. Uh, and it was a really embarrassing one as well, because obviously it was something that leftists kept on bringing up again and again, and rightly so. Uh, you shouldn't be sitting there condemning something if you don't even know the name of it, right? But yeah. anyway, what's interesting about Levin's book and... It's much, much worse than James Lindsay's text, by the way. I'm, like James Lindsay's book is being in time. You know, you're, you said you read Heidegger, right? You know, compared to uh, American Marxism, right? But the you know, the basically the thing that Levin does is he almost seems to want to be overcompensating uh, for the claim that a lot of leftists have made that conservatives don't read progressive authors by just heaping references at you, just like sometimes actually three or four pages uh, of quotations at a time without any kind oh of- Oh my God, that, that's, I don't know how many academic principles that violates. Oh, it does. I mean, the, like I said, if the book was handed in by an undergraduate student, you would immediately have it turned uh, into whatever ethics community you have uh, because yeah. you, you call it plagiarism, right? I, I mean, and sometimes this is just embarrassingly funny. Like um, in one circumstance, he actually lists the table of contents of a book uh, before going on to quote the rest of the introduction. Like that's how, you know. Like he just copied and pasted it too much? Yeah, I mean, my working theory is that Levin probably just didn't actually write the book, but got his assistant to go on to Google, uh, read a whack load of different left-wing texts, uh, copied and pasted a bunch of them together, uh, and then inserted... You know, you ever read any kind of, you know, remember newspapers, you know, they have like the subheadings or the subtitles to pictures and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I write for my college's newspaper. So Well, there you go. So this is basically what the book is. It's these giant block quotations, a little insult, uh, another giant block quotation, 
two sentences worth of insults, not the block quotation, right? Uh, and Lindsay's book is really quite similar, right? Uh, it's better in the sense that you do get some historical analysis, you do get attempt to kind of make links between these different chains of thought. Uh, there are occasionally a few arguments that he'll marshal, uh, particularly against people like Marx, for example, right? That's the one that I responded to, but it's not much, right? Uh, and again, it's mostly because he just says, if you just show you what these people are saying and present you with this kind of history, uh, as I understand it, it'll just be so clearly bad that nobody will want to possibly buy yeah. into what they have, they're trying to sell. I've honestly seen that um, style of content on a, on a much broader sense within the right wing sphere. I, I think this goes on to YouTube as well, mm -hmm. um, especially if you remember a bunch of anti SJW content. Um, <laughs> yeah, and people are worried that it's it's going to come back because it's been about six seven years since the last big wave happened. Oh yeah, the um, anti S the anti SJW fail compilation. I yeah, like those, yeah. the twenty sixteen. It's been about six years since then. Yeah. Um, but also like the, the content itself is generally very lazy. It's like, it's like you show this clip of this random feminist you found getting a little angry and then you just like add like 10, 20 seconds of uh, comments and then you show another clip and then that's the entire video. And I've seen entire channels that are just that over and over again, like three posts a day kind of channels. Yeah, I would say that it's very similar aesthetically, right? Uh, in the sense that uh, these aren't intended to critically analyze, let alone to respond argumentatively uh, to the positions uh, of you know, leftists uh, or even kind of left liberals, right? Uh, what this is intended to do is to ridicule them uh, and to make them seem so ridiculous uh, or so out there that they're not worth listening to in the first case, like in the first place. Uh, now, the SJW fail compilations are embarrassingly stupid, right? Yeah. Um, in the way that they're pitching things. Uh, What's interesting about Lindsay's book is you could see it as kind of the intellectual equivalent uh, of something like that, where you just paste together a bunch of what much smarter uh, people have had to say, you know, lines from their books, references to some of their works, their biographies, et cetera, throw it all up there and say, isn't this ridiculous? Uh, and expect people to have the same reaction. So credit to him for actually reading some of these people. Uh, it's just next time I'd like to have a couple of words about why they're wrong. <laughs> I think that's a pretty, reasonable thing to ask uh, when you're setting yourself up as a critic of not just one, but several uh, interlocking traditions. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're probably going to get that out of him unless it's uh, like in a not. personal debate to where he would have to face social consequences for not answering the question. Oh, absolutely. And it's worth noting that in some circumstances uh, where he is actually presented with somebody who knows what he's talking about, uh, he tends to kind of back down a little bit. Uh, there was a very famous interview he did um, I can't remember what it was. It was on MSNBC, uh, where somebody actually delineated between different schools of thought uh, that led up to critical race theory. And Lindsay was just like, boy, you sure know a lot about this. Uh, and then kind of withdrew, right? And it's because the guy actually knew what he was talking about and was able to point out that his interpretation of just the history, not even the arguments, but just the history, yeah. had some big giant holes in it. Uh, and reading his book, uh, that interview is pretty representative of the kind of quality analysis that you get in race Marxism. Quantity over quality, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, look, it doesn't take that much effort to go and copy and paste a bunch of quotes from, I don't know, you know, Derek Bell's writings um, or Kimberly Crenshaw's yeah. writings uh, and throw in a few references here and there to Marx uh, and then you know, produce a 300 page book, right? It's really not that difficult and what I worry about in some respects is people who come to this, uh, who are predisposed to disliking critical race theory or predisposed to dismissing critical race theory, will probably look at it uh, as an legi intellectually legitimate enterprise because it does seem pretty learned, right? I mean, I gotta give him that. Like he does look like he's read a lot. And this is what some of the comments on Twitter have been saying about my piece, right? Uh, so it's a bad book and a very strange book in a more subtle sense uh, than, Again, your Jordan Peterson uh, types where you're just kind of like, well, you clearly never actually bothered to even crack open the spine of Das Kapital. Uh, so yeah, that, that's so funny yeah. to me as a philosophy major is that like somebody that has followed Zizek because Jordan Peterson, one of like supposedly one of the biggest academics um, of the current era, walks up to debate Zizek, one of the other biggest current philosophers of the era, and has only read the Communist Manifesto. 
Yeah, and that only uh, twice in you know 20 or 30 years. Uh, and again, it's worth noting that the Communist Manifesto, if you take out all those fucking prefaces and introductions and translators' introductions and you know uh, <laughs> interpreters' introductions, it's probably about 25, 30 pages if you beef up the type, right? Yeah. Uh, and look, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's a very interesting piece of writing. It makes some extraordinary intuitive leaps uh, in reasoning. Uh, and it's intended to be kind of provocative. Uh, I mean, there's the wonderful stuff about everything that is solid melting into air, right? And yeah. uh, the constant revolutionizing and transformation of fixed, fast, frozen relations, right? Vivid stuff. Uh, but the real argument for Marxism is in capital, which has its literary moments and flourishes, but as anybody who's gone through it knows, is mm -hmm. often a pretty dry, sometimes extraordinarily uh, monotonous book that just happens to have a lot of very smart, things to say uh, about capitalism while being very flawed in other ways. Right? Yeah, I've gotten through maybe a collective 50 pages of which were not continuous in capital. Well, hey, you should be commended for that, right? I mean, you probably read more. <laughs> you've read more Marxism now than Jordan Peterson. So congratulations. If you ever decide to go right, you could set yourself up as a critic. Yeah, well, I, I've read a lot of other Marx. It's just the economic part is not very interesting to me as a philosophy major. So I Capital is not, not where I'm supposed to be at, I guess. Um, oh, hey, look, very fair. Not, like, life is way too short to focus on everything, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, after, I mean, I've been, a, been reading Marx maybe three years now, 2019, yeah. 2020. And it is, like, there are so many criticisms of Marx out there. Um, I mean, the Frankfurt School itself is a giant criticism of Marx, practically, um, answering the question of why hasn't the revolution happened yet? Why did these thinkers, I guess, that you're working with, Peterson, Lindsay, um, et cetera, I don't know who else would be on that list because I don't care about them. Uh, but why did they think that every one of these thinkers that follows Marx or takes part of Marx just kind of believes all of Marxism, I guess? Uh, well, they don't necessarily, right? Uh, I mean, the narrative is a little bit different. Uh, and again, it's usually wrong, uh, but it's intended to give a bit of kind of intellectual gloss uh, to some of these positions, right? So Peterson's argument, which again is wrong, I should say, uh, is that circa the 1960s, 1950s, it's a little bit indeterminate, uh, Marxism became so discredited because uh, of its association with the Soviet Union that you saw an attempt to essentially revamp uh, or relaunch or rebrand uh, the Marxist position through something like postmodern philosophy. Uh, and this is what Derrida, Foucault, and the others were doing. Uh, and I mean, it, that's a very distorted image of how things were going on. I mean, in the 1960s, arguably the most intellectually infamous uh, people on France's scene uh, were Marxist theorists like Jean-Paul Sartre, like Louis Althusser, who occupied very prominent roles in the public discourse. The Communist Party uh, was one of, if not the strongest in France and looked actually set to win real power. Uh, yeah. Around the time when a lot of these postmodern authors came, you actually saw a kind of crest uh, of socialist activism that you know, culminated in May 68. And there's all kinds of stuff written about that, right? But yeah. this kind of narrative uh, is really distorted and just on the face of it wrong. Uh, not only that, it does a real intellectual disservice to both the innovations made by people like Foucault and Derrida, um, independent of their connection with any kind of politics, and also the limitations of their own analyses, right? Let's just be clear yeah. on that, right? Uh, Lindsay's story is a little bit different, right? Uh, Lindsay's story is that you have to kind of run all the way back to um, the Rousseauian uh, origins uh, of critical race theory uh, in the writings of people like Rousseau or Hegel. Uh, and then you kind of move forward to Marx, who's the kind of volcano uh, out of which all of these bad things emerged um, for the most part in their current form. Uh, but then he traces how he thinks Marxism itself underwent a number of different genealogical shifts. Uh, for instance, you know, it's cultural turn starting in the early 20th century with people like Gramsci or Benjamin, uh, and then the turn towards things like the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, particularly the Marcuse, is somebody spends a lot of time on. And then he makes an argument that this Marcusean, Gramscian uh, kind of approach to Marxism is eventually what evolved into something like critical race theory. Uh, which again, I want to point out, uh, isn't entirely incorrect. I mean, there's no doubt that Marcuse and Gramsci both have had an impact on some critical race theorists, right? Uh, but it's extremely reductive to just suggest that that's all there is to this story. Uh, and it is also, again, uh, kind of doing a disservice to the innovations and importance of critical race theorists on their own merits uh, by yeah. suggesting that they're all part of this thing that I said was bad at the beginning, 
And so it remains bad now at the end. Uh, and since oh. I don't think he understands even what Marx was talking about at the beginning, uh, it's a pretty shitty kind of argument. I mean, yeah, I mean, from my limited reading of critical race theory, I think I've gotten maybe through five or six essays total in the anthology book I have. But just critical race theory itself, uh, without excluding all the critical theory I've read that already disagrees with <laughs> each other there. But like, there's so many critical race theorists that just go on different paths. Some are fairly optimistic uh, with a bit of pessimism, and then some are extremely pessimistic with like your very little insertions of optimism here and there. Like there, it's such an expansive field that it is kind of, it's just kind of a disservice to whatever intellectual project you're doing to even try to critique it by labeling it all as one thing, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's worth noting that um, there are critical race theorists uh, who've drawn fairly heavily on Marx. Uh, there are also philosophers who lean heavily um, or talk a lot about issues of race. Uh, Somebody like Cornell West, right, will lean on Marx. Uh, but that's by no means, uh, you know, the only part of the story, right? Somebody like, say, La uh, or uh, Kimberly Crenshaw tend to be left-wing liberals, right? Uh, in the sense that, uh, to invoke Crenshaw's kind of recent interview, they believe in the kind of founding principles of the American Revolution, right? Uh, liberty and equality for all. Uh, but they think that that will never be achieved unless the United States acknowledges this long history of racial discrimination takes it seriously and tries to rectify uh, the inequities that emerges as a result of racial discrimination, right? Uh, and the reality is, I mean, I just don't think there's any arguing against that, right? Uh, the United States uh, was a deeply and perfectly liberal society for a long time, uh, arguably until 1968. Uh, you couldn't even really call the United States a fully functioning democracy since so many people were excluded from being able to exercise the most fundamental right, which is to vote, right? Uh, or one of the most fundamental rights, I yeah. should say. Uh, and, you know, they analyze these histories uh, with a lot of acuity and a lot of sensitivity. That's very different than somebody like Derek Bell, uh, who underwent kind of a transition, starting out uh, as kind of a left-wing liberal uh, who believed in the civil rights movement, thought that you could change things uh, from below and above uh, if you just mobilize a movement uh, that's sufficiently committed uh, to challenging institutional racism. Uh, but then later on became more pessimistic, uh, probably as a result, or not probably, as a result of things like Reagan uh, and the kind yeah. of... Reaganomics policy that had a horrific impact uh, and also on minority communities and also retrenched many of the worst aspects uh, of the system of racialization that existed at the height of Jim Crow. Things like high levels of policing, incarceration, you name it. Yeah, I remember reading through his um, essay, uh, I think it's Race Realism is the title of it, and it's it's yeah. very pessimistic. That there's, a, there's a little bit of hope at the end in saying that there is you can get back power by just constantly making it harder for uh, white people in power or the police to operate uh, with the example of his grandma, I think. Um, that, was, that was the funny part. But my favorite part of that essay, um, this is a little bit of a tangent off, was uh, he spends about a, a paragraph or two discussing how much of a slap in the face it was for the black community for uh, Reagan to nominate Clarence Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, Cornell West uh, is still bitter about that. Uh, I w <laughs> brought it up in a recent interview for the New Yorker. Um, it's also a prominent part of race matters. Uh, and look, I mean, uh, it's worth noting that there is a kind of prominent black conservative movement uh, in the United mm -hmm. States. It's not very big and it's not very representative of the community as a whole, uh, but it does exist. And you can find it with people like Thomas Sowell or Candace Owens or Clarence Thomas. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's important not to generalize uh, about people. Uh, people aren't just their, the color of their skin or anything else. Uh, they have their own independent identities uh, separate from the social circumstances in which they're brought up. Uh, and sometimes that can take them to some unusual places. Uh, and again, this is one of the reasons I think actually, uh, if we're going to be confronting something like the conservative tradition, it's important to look at their arguments uh, and to try to confront them and criticize them that way, rather than trying to say, you belong to this block, uh, it's all bad because I say so, and let's just dismiss yeah. it here. And let's just dismiss it, right? Uh, and in many ways, the kind of irony is that Lindsay, uh, by just saying, all you people have opinions that I don't like uh, because I say so, uh, so to hell with you. Uh, it's kind of emulating a lot of the kind of tropes, uh, particularly the online tropes that he claims to be so critical of. Yeah, kind of a, an anti-academic, uh, academic, academic pursuit, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yeah, 
yeah, exactly, right? I mean, it's what I sometimes call postmodern conservatism or what I uh. usually call postmodern conservatism, right? In the sense that he doesn't feel compelled to kind of argue substantively against the positions of somebody like Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw or Karl Marx for that matter. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, any one of those could be interesting projects that a conservative intellectual could carry out. And I want to point out that I have some respect for certain conservative intellectuals, people like Roger Scruton, because they did that, right? If you read a book like Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands by Roger Scruton, uh, he sits there and he has chapters on Foucault, Warkin, Habermas, Deleuze, uh, and he sits there and he unpacks what he thinks they're saying, and then he offers some rebuttals of their positions. Uh, I don't agree with all of them, and I think sometimes he just really doesn't understand what these people are saying, but every now and then he does actually land a few blows. Uh, and if you're a truthful and honest leftist, you have to say, well, maybe he's right that there's this problem uh, with the way this person thought about things. That's not what Lindsay does, right? Again, Lindsay just says, isn't this a load of crap? Because I say so. Uh, and look at this history and look at how dumb it is. And look at the weird things these people say. Look at how they're challenging the things that I believe, which are all obviously true. Uh, there's nothing of the kind of quality thinking that you'd find in somebody like Scruton. I mean, uh, going back to, I think, a more general audience than other forms of uh media, I guess. Um, I think the current scare against critical race theory is a very particular matter that does need to kind of be addressed because um, we're seeing states kind of ban it just willy nilly um, yeah. and it, giving critical race theory such a, a broad umbrella, um, having somewhat of a background in it and a background in um, the conservative reaction to it. What would you kind of say this, I guess, critical race theory scare um, is about? Well, I'll say that there are two things about this, right? First off, uh, this is something that progressives need to understand because we're sometimes prone to dismissing this uh, or to being too optimistic because uh, there's a kind of teleological sensibility that you can find in some variants of leftism, by which I mean, we think that uh, activism and progress on race always only moves in one direction, right? It moves forward, things get better, uh, we're not going to see any kind of regressions. Uh, and one of the things that critical race theory uh, and other scholars, as point out, to, like Alexander Kesar, will draw our attention to, is that American history, uh, when it comes to issues like race, is much better understood as a kind of push and pull dynamic, right? Where there's an advanced main uh, in some respects um, by racialized populations, uh, and then there's a pushback. Uh, and sometimes that pushback can be extraordinarily successful, right? Uh, one of the most prominent examples of this, of course, uh, is in the post-Civil War South, right, where yeah. there was a massive effort to kind of rewrite the history uh, by people like uh, Sisters of the Southern Confederacy, right, or her daughters yeah. of the Southern Confederacy. Yeah, we just went through that in my um, African-American history class. Um, but yeah, exactly. And I mean, they tried to rewrite the history of what happened, right? And they're one of the ones that are responsible for all this kind of BS about the war really being about states' rights. Uh, yeah. But you know, politically, they were extremely successful, enough that they were able to get even mainstream political movements in the North to kind of buy into this narrative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then you saw advances take place again, starting in the 1940s, like 40s, culminating in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and then regressing again in the 1980s, uh, now using a much more coded language, uh, like we'd see in yeah. Reagan's you know, speeches about welfare queens, right? And uh, dangerous youth with drugs, you know, all the kind of stuff that's very clearly meant to have a racial quality to it, uh, but doesn't actually use overtly racist language. You know, yeah. Age of dog whistling, right? Uh, then we saw some progress again with Barack Obama, uh, not nearly as much as I would have liked, but it's progress, right? And I think. Only the most pessimistic critical race theorists would say uh, having a person of color as the president of the United States doesn't really change anything, right? Uh, maybe if you're Aaron Magruder or something, but I saw it, you know, as a positive like uh, development and many others did it well, uh, but then you got Trump, right? And that's a serious regression again, right? Yeah. Uh, and so this latest attack on critical race theory and the attempt to seriously reckon uh, with the racial legacy uh, of racism, slavery, uh, colonialism in the United States uh, poses a very real threat and it could put on hold the effort to try to create a more equal society for decades uh, if the Republicans oh, wow. are successful. Oh, absolutely, right? I mean, think about the time blocks that I'm talking about, right? Uh, after, you know, the American Civil War if, uh, in the 1860s, it was almost a century before you saw a significant movement take place again to try to yeah. rectify national inequities. After the Civil Rights Movement, uh, it really took until things like the Obama era uh, or the contemporary era before you started to see some kind of movements again uh, to try to deal with 
the more contemporary kinds of issues. Uh, and I'd still say that we have a hugely long way to go. Uh, if you look at statistics about disparities uh, in terms of the amount of wealth owned by uh, persons of color and racialized minorities versus the white majority population, in terms of the prison population, uh, in terms of outlooks on life uh, and how well you think things are gonna go, even in terms of things like death rates, right? Uh, and if we allow the GOP and the conservative movement to block having an honest reckoning uh, with these histories uh, and to abstain uh, or to prevent any kind of further movement, uh, it could be decades before the window is open again. I, I guess my the best reply I have, what I was what I was thinking of when you were saying that is isn't there kind of a little bit of a hopeful tinge in kind of how it's being done is kind of a, somewhat a mission of defeat to a degree in that the conservatives, they have to indoctrinate kids with purposefully um, false information to be able to keep them on their political side. Yes, I think so, right? Uh, and I mean, this is something that progressives haven't always understood uh, about the conservative tradition, right? Because the conservative tradition, just like the political left, goes through different phases, right? Uh, it has more strident and bellicose phases, uh, like during the 1980s. Uh, and one of the things that you saw during the 1980s is conservatism really adopted, uh, particularly in the Anglosphere, a kind of universalistic outlook uh, that was quite different than the more kind of uh, national chauvinistic forms that we see today. And you think about Reagan and his shining city on the hill uh, kind of references, uh, or all the kind of bullshit about the United States being the indispensable country, right, that the world absolutely needed, uh, you know, including all those people in Latin America who had very different opinions about the United States when Reagan was in power, you know, let's just oh. put it that way. You know, or you think about something like Margaret Thatcher, right, with this very firm assertion that there's no alternative uh, but to implement her kind of neoliberal with social conservative uh, policies. It's a very strident kind of conservatism. What you see right now, I think, uh, and Tori Robin has some really good pieces on this, is a growing awareness of the fact on the part of the Republican Party that they increasingly represent a minority view in the U.S., right? And there's a lot of evidence to that effect, right? Uh, for the past eight elections, seven of them uh, have been won by a Democrat in terms of who receives the majority vote. Um, you consistently see the U.S. Senate uh, and de sorry, Democratic seats in the U.S. Senate representing 20 million or more people uh, than you know, the Republican held seats. Uh, and those numbers would probably be higher uh, if you actually had a system that allowed voters uh, more meaningful avenues to vote. Because uh, yeah. if you think about all the things like, um, for instance, suppress, uh, voter suppression techniques, uh, for instance, not allowing prisoners to vote and stuff. And then not allowing people in Puerto Rico uh, to, you know, uh, have a actual rate. senator. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, so what you have in that kind of circumstance is a Republican Party that claims to be populist, but actually represents a dwindling minority of the population. Uh, but still powerful enough to try to gain the system uh, to hold on to power by whatever means uh, it can. Uh, and what I think you're going to start to see in the future is since the conservative movement in the United States and elsewhere, right, can't rely on the kind of majoritarian energies uh, that it was once able to enjoy under Ronald Reagan, uh, you're increasingly going to see them use ironically all the kind of technocratic and elitist measures uh, that they accuse yeah. the Democrats of using uh, in order to wedge any kind of advantage uh, that they can. Uh, it's no surprise that you know, Donald Trump uh, once uh, claimed that Mitch McConnell's primary obsession uh, was courts and judges, courts and judges. Uh, and that should tell you a lot, right? Mitch McConnell, again, GOP leader in the Senate. Uh, it's because McConnell is smart enough to know that if the people in the United States or most of the people in the United States got what they wanted, uh, his party uh, would either have to completely change their policy approaches to things yeah. Uh, or they would have to relegate themselves to being the opposition for a long time. They don't want to do either of these things. Uh, so the best way to, is to try to make sure that all the least democratic institutions in the country are as conservative as possible. So that even if you have democratic majorities uh, or support uh, for the Democratic Party uh, or left parties by a majority of the population, they're not going to be able to get anything meaningful done. And conservatives will see, will see the policy outcomes that they want entrenched. So he's pulling a John Adams pretty much. Yeah, no, 100%, right? And I mean, this is what you see whenever you get all that kind of bullshit about the United States is not a, a, a democracy, it's a republic, right? Uh, you know, or when people will say things like, well, you know, urban elites are already overrepresented. So, you know, we need to counterbalance that by giving rural people 
apparently even more uh, representation uh, yeah. in the Electoral College or the Senate, because three times uh, as much as an NF, right? I, I mean, I kind of see it as, um, I think the thing that has drifted away from universalism into the popular chauvinistic thing is kind of the end result of the culture war that spawns out of the late 80s and 90s. Um, I guess my understanding of that is that um, you see the slow kind of independence of children from their parents and specifically the more conservative parents of where children are able to grow up more independently. Originally, that might be the latchkey kids that can go back to their house after school and just watch television before their parents get home in a few hours. Um, and then the introduction of the internet to where it doesn't matter if the parents pick them up or they go home alone on the bus. Um, the child has access to pretty much all of the information in the world. And then just kind of how that goes on to Twitter, TikTok, et cetera, where an increasingly younger audience has this uh, access to views that conservatives aren't typically approving of. Yeah, I, I think that plays a big part in it, right? Uh, and I think that you've seen the cultural discourse, at least the mainstream cultural discourse around race uh, in the United States move in a moderately uh, more progressive direction uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, and interestingly enough, a lot of that has been propelled uh, by big business, right? Uh, which has increasingly embraced this woke approach uh, to marketing uh, and corporate inclusion. Uh, and I mean, there are ways to be critical of that from a kind of left perspective and people like Cornell West are, uh, but it has had the impact of trying to mainstream uh, a degree of racial sensitivity uh, and sensitivity to inclusion that we've never seen before, right? Especially yeah. because historically um, capital uh, and big business have been in league with a party that with uh, more racially antagonistic uh, kind of approaches to US politics, right? Uh, and so what you interestingly started to see recently uh, is as a result of this, uh, the Republican Party has adopted a slightly more critical line uh, towards big business uh, that kind of plagiarizes or apes uh, certain kind of forms of left wing rhetoric, uh, where they'll criticize things like big tech, right, for yeah. sensory conservatives, uh, or they'll criticize woke capitalism uh, for, you know, all right, supporting BLM uh, when it comes to selling things like Nike shoes, right? Uh, but one of the things that I continuously want to stress is that uh, it's really easy to overstate the significance of this, uh, because sometimes people will say, well, does this mean conservatives are becoming critical of capitalism? Uh, and my response no. is not at all, right? Uh, what they're becoming critical of is various liberal forms of capitalism uh, that are interested in being more inclusive uh, for basically uh, cultural uh, and <laughs> profit-motivated motivated reasons, right? Uh, they're perfectly content with a form of capitalism uh, that bars people uh, and corporations from engaging in these kinds of actions. And there's a large precedence for that, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, in the 1950s, uh, there were plenty of businesses in the South that wanted to be racially inclusive because obviously being able to sell uh, to people of color or racialized communities would mean higher profits. Uh, and US conservatives said, no, Right. Uh, uh, some things are higher than the market and our right to discriminate is in these cases, at least more important uh, than simply making as much money as possible. Yeah. I'm trying to remember where I was planning to go. Uh, do you have anything more to say on that while I try and think? Sure. I mean, this is the point where um, I just wanted to kind of make a statement about my own political views. Right. Yeah. Because uh, on the one hand, I, I'm very pro-inclusion uh, in the sense that I think that we need more representation uh, of racialized communities and other groups that have historically uh, been denied a voice, both in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, on the other hand, I think that woke capitalism is a serious danger, uh, in part because I think that what you see with it uh, is legitimation uh, of the neoliberal order by making it more rainbow colored, uh, and yeah. that in turn leads people to be less critical uh, of the political economic issues that I see to be uh, see as being decisive uh, in this time period. And this is interesting, actually, because it's a point where you can actually see a bifurcation uh, between at least a certain kind of agitation for racial collusion uh, and a desire for more broad structural transformations in the economy. Uh, and this is why the term race Marxism can be so problematic, because uh, Marxists are amongst the people who have been the most critical uh, of this attempt to kind of rebrand capitalism uh, as having a happy face, rainbow colored face, right? Uh, 
And I think that there are a lot of good reasons uh, to be skeptical of that kind of maneuver. Uh, yeah. While at the same time, we always have to avoid the temptation of being critical or being you know, dismissive uh, of the man's for inclusion. Uh, getting the balance right is hard. Yeah, okay. I remember the thought I had, but it was kind of like, um, there, there is at least recently from what I've seen kind of woke capitalism kind of in its dual nature of presenting as woke, but still kind of wanting the Republican party to win because it offers low taxes, um, kind of biting itself on the ass because it promotes these um, woke ideas. But if you think about it for a while, you can't necessarily um, separate social um, and economic, I guess, more left-wing views. So if you're going to be socially more left-wing, then eventually you're going to come around and be like, wait, we have to be economically left-wing as well. Um, so particularly with, I think it was Disney about last week, um, <laughs> they do all this like LGBTQ and Q, uh, inclusion. Um, even recently, I found out that a lot of the um, LGBTQ stuff in shows is kind of like really hard fault for um, and barely gets past um, Disney. Like the artists making those shows or movies have to fight tooth and nail to get anything they can in. And then Disney is out here supporting uh, Florida Republicans because it, gives, it probably gives them less taxes on Disneyland or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is again where we need to be very cautious uh, in our analysis, right? Because on the one hand, I think it's great uh, that we have more inclusion and more representation um, in mainstream outlets like Disney, right? I think that offering young children uh, figures that look like them and role models that look like them uh, is a good idea in principle. Uh, the problem I have is the form uh, or the narrative uh, that's usually associated uh, with these kind of role models, which tend to uphold this very individualistic, uh, highly possessive and deeply kind of competitive ethos, uh, and just suggest that, well, now we're going to create a society where regardless of the color of your skin or your gender or your sexual orientation, uh, you too can compete to be in the highest offices of the land while the rest of the people will sit there working at McDonald's for pennies an hour, right? Um, so just make sure that it's not you who's working in the McDonald's. Uh, so you by getting one of the one in a hundred positions uh, that's actually reasonably well paid. Uh, and the left needs to be very critical of this. Uh, and one of the places where you start to see this split uh, is of course that most people who do demand uh, high racial inclusion or do wanna see justice uh, when it comes to excising the history of racism in the United States tend to argue that we need very serious efforts uh, to try to look uh, at political economy since we know that there's a deep intersection between uh, racialized groups uh, and a lower socioeconomic stand, uh, sorry, status uh, and standard of living. Uh, and it's worth noting that, of course, this is one of the things that will capitalism never moves on. Right? There's yeah. not any effort whatsoever uh, to try to compensate for the abiding material um, inequities that have emerged because of racialization. Because if there was movement on that, uh, it would lead to a bigger, deeper, uh, and more challenging conversation about whether the socioeconomic system as a whole uh, is fair, right? Uh, or whether it should be radically rethought. Uh, and I'm with Cornell West in saying that I think we need to radically rethink it at this point for the sake uh, of racial justice, uh, but also for the sake uh, of everyone else as well. Uh, and for that matter, the goddamn planet. <laughs> yeah, uh, what was it? I saw it today, it was like uh, Antarctica, a part of Antarctica was like 70 degrees higher than it was supposed to be today or a few days ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. I saw that too, and that fucking blew my mind. Right? I'm like, well, we're shit. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a, gonna roast. It is a very weird um, dual nature, as I kind of pointed out. That woke capitalism kind of has. It's just to a, to a degree, it feels like it be believes that it can say the right things, and that's all that kind of matters. Um, especially with stuff like Disney or companies like BP that somehow have commercials of, of about um, being environmentally friendly or something like that. Um, Chevron, who, um, if you know the, I forget what the lawyer's case is, um, but someone that was sued by Chevron for winning a um, like $10 billion settlement after they spilled uh, toxic chemicals and oil um, in Ecuador uh, was countersued falsely and put in house arrest for years. Um, and then like Chevron ads are just about how friendly the corporation is or something like that. It's so weird to me. Oh yeah, it's extremely bizarre, right? Uh, and I mean, there's no getting away from this problem because the reality is that 
these companies aren't there to sell products and they're certainly not there to make society into a better place. Yeah. Uh, they're there first and foremost in order to make a profit, right? Um, to extract surplus value. And the thing is, sometimes uh, it can be to their benefit uh, to kind of adopt uh, a rainbow uh, outlook on things, uh, both to try to brand themselves more effectively uh, and to try to pitch themselves uh, to that youth audience that you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, and again, don't get me wrong. I'm not such a cynic that I would say every time we do they somebody does like that, we should tell them to fuck off. Right? You know, if Starbucks wants to promote LGBTQ rights, at least they're doing something, right? Um, yeah. But if Starbucks is supporting LGBTQ rights, uh, does that mean that they're making s- stronger movements uh, to try to allow their workers to unionize? You know, recent cases in the United States would say that actually they did everything they could to prevent their workers from unionizing. And uh, still does fell. that have... What? Yeah. And still felt. Yes. Thank God. Right. Uh, You know, would that have an impact on on their employees who are LGBTQ? Right. Probably. Right. Uh, Are they are we seeing more on the part of Nike to try to improve its labor practices uh, in much of East Asia? Probably not. Right. Even though they'll be happy to try to talk about BLM uh, and how all lives matter, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in the United States in order to try to sell suits. Right. Uh, I think that if we really wanted to see movement on racial justice, then maybe they could fucking improve the laboring conditions uh, for a lot of people who are working in sweatshops uh, across various little islands in Southeast Asia, right? Mm -hmm. That might make a difference to them. Uh, But these are the kind of things that you don't see uh, a lot of movement on, precisely as you put it, because it's very easy to say things uh, and to kind of pat yourself on the shoulder and say, isn't that wonderful? Uh, Actually making meaningful structural changes is gonna fundamentally change, uh, not just, you know, the way that we do things, but the power dynamics in our society. Yeah. And that's why we need to do something far more drastic um, than just slap a rainbow uh, on a Starbucks coffee, uh, as nice as that is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just kind of trying to win on a symbolic front while the um, reality behind the corporations is horrible. I remember watching in seventh grade my social studies class, um, there was a documentary about how, what was it? They get paid in Indonesia uh, 175 a day by uh, Nike to make their shoes and they're forced by the police to work. Um, I remember one quote, it was, um, if they want to like buy a new toothbrush, they have to like, for they have to be, be able to sacrifice a few meals. Yeah, and I mean, if you think about it, that's an obscene uh, kind of outlook, right? And the irony is that you don't need to be a Marxist to think it's obscene, which is also yeah. one of the points that I made just to bring it back to Lindsay uh, at the conclusion of my article. Um, there are a lot of egalitarian liberals, utilitarians, uh, people who want nothing to do with Marxism. John right? Rawls. Yeah, John Rawls, right, who's you know personal hero of mine, who would say, look, you know, the moral question that's raised to us in these kind of circumstances are is if the resources exist to provide these people with a decent standard of living, and we are capable uh, of doing so, is there any kind of justification for not providing them with a decent standard yeah. of living when it would minimally impair in many circumstances our, our own quality of life uh, and it would rectify some of the dramatic power imbalances that we see in our society? Uh, and Rawls and many other liberals would say, there's no just argument uh, for doing that. If anything, the just argument would be to undertake those kinds of actions, right? Uh, and so it's worth noting, and this is what I find really offensive, that people like Lindsay, uh, who claim to be speaking on behalf of the liberal tradition, really do a disservice to that tradition uh, by yeah. speaking to its ugliest, uh, oldest, uh, and most selfish uh, dimensions, rather than the sides of liberalism uh, that are really in keeping with the promise of enlightenment, uh, which is achieving a world of liberté, égalité, and solidarité for all, right? Uh, and you know, doing that's gonna be very difficult, but it's a dream that was worth having uh, in the 18th century, and I think it's a dream that we should still hold to today. Uh, we just need to recognize that there's a lot more work to be done uh, in order to achieve such a world. Yeah, I, I guess going back to all the way back to Lindsay and Peterson and the, I guess, contemporary conservatives, it seems that a lot of them support stuff like charity, um, mostly following within their Christian, general Christian principles. What do you think is stopping most conservatives from making this leap into this egalitarian liberalism? I think there are a lot of different things, okay? Um, I'll just put foreground two. Okay. Now, first off, I want to say from the get-go uh, that I am not opposed to charity, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that I'm not either. Yeah, you know, I give money, 
I have friends who give money. I think that people should give money and I think people should give more money, right? Uh, but the problem with charity uh, is twofold, right? Uh, one is it doesn't actually transform the structural dynamics and power relations in society in any kind of meaningful way uh, because it makes the reception of aid dependent upon someone else's goodwill uh, yeah. and makes you dependent on that person, right? Uh, whereas something like welfare measures, right? Modest as they might be, uh, does at least challenge elements uh, of the power dynamics and social relations in our society uh, by making the reception of social aid uh, into a right, right? If you need it, you get it, right? Uh, and somebody else has to provide it, uh, which means they might not be able to buy a yacht if they so want, right? Uh, and so that's really important. Uh, now, we can be critical of various aspects of the welfare state from along a wide variety of different dimensions, uh, but I think that this uh, tendency uh, to make something into a right rather than into an act of charity uh, or an act of benevolence uh, is one of the reasons conservatives have always been critical of it, right? Uh, the other reason why it's important to understand this uh, is the conservative approach to, at least in the United States, and this isn't true everywhere, okay? I wanna really stress that. But in the United States, the way conservatives have typically understood poverty uh, or insisted at least that poverty be understood uh, is as an individual failing, right? Uh, where the system is benign, uh, or even benevolent in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and as long as you follow the rules uh, and do what you're supposed to, you'll be okay. Uh, so yeah. if you aren't okay, by definition, you must have been somebody who didn't follow the rules and didn't do what you're supposed to, right? Uh, now, in those kind of circumstances, it can be an act of magnanimity uh, on the part of somebody who's rich enough to kind of give you a second chance uh, and give you the opportunity to kind of raise yourself up. Uh, but to again, imply that you have some kind of right uh, to recourse in these circumstances uh, would not only be to give you some kind of power uh, relative to the most affluent and powerful in our society, uh, but it would also be to suggest that maybe this isn't your fault, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe there are structural reasons why you ended up where you were because so many people are in the same circumstance and we would need to rethink uh, these kind of ideological conceits at a more fundamental level. Uh, yeah. And a lot of conservatives don't want to do that, right? Because this applies upwards as well as downwards, right? Uh, if it's not the yeah. fault of the poor that they are where they are, uh, it's in some senses the system's fault, then the fact that the rich are where they are, the powerful are where they are, is also morally arbitrary. Uh, and if it's more, or as a res result of uh, extraordinary forms of discrimination. Uh, and if it is the result of morally arbitrary or discriminatory forces, then we would very, very quickly ask ourselves, why have this system? <laughs> why not have a different one instead? Uh, one that's a lot better and more egalitarian and democratic. Yeah, that, that was kind of uh, my realization of, um, I guess, that systematic thinking was it kind of came about maybe like six or so months before I became liberal. And then within a few months, a leftist, I was just kind of I kind of had this thought. And I think I said it to one of my friends back in high school. I was just I was thinking about it. And I was like, wait, everybody can't be rich so that it has to be poor people for the rich. So it can't really be a meritocracy if you necessitate these lower classes um, for the existence of these upper classes. And I didn't put the pieces together yet. And I think I had one of the friends I say it to come back to me after I had had this conversion into um, leftism slash Marxism. And they were like, yeah, that, that's true. And I think they got a different perception out of it of where that realization kind of fundamentally transformed the type of person I am. They just kind of accepted it in with their, uh, I guess, capitalist schema. Not necessarily to demonize them, but. No, I think that's exactly right. Uh, now, the meritocracy point is an important one, right? Uh, now, I know we're not talking directly about that, but I'll just say yeah. a few words on it, right? Because uh, I want, in some respects, a meritocratic uh, conception of justice uh, is superior uh, to some of the ones that we've seen before. Uh, because what you used to see in the good old kind of scholastic Aristotelian universe is this idea that there's an organic hierarchy. It's set by God. It's intended to be permanent. Uh, yeah. And where you are uh, at the beginning of your life is where you're going to end up, right? Uh, and at the very least, meritocracy pays egalitarianism the homage uh, of suggesting that look, any the hierarchy is going to be fluid, it's going to be changed, uh, at least in principle, uh, and anyone can rise to the top uh, on their own merits if they try, right? Uh, this is a kind of pure uh, idea of meritocracy. Uh, now, some people try to criticize meritocracy by saying, well, it's never been like that in the United States. Obviously, uh, there's extraordinary forms of misogyny, racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, 
uh, that have been in place that have posed very real barriers and obvious barriers to equal participation of everyone in this participation, and that's fair. But I think we need to be deeper in our criticism of meritocracy, uh, because I think that even if you were to expunge all that, meritocracy would still be a deeply flawed way of looking at the world. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons, uh, but one of them that we can foreground here is that meritocracy holds that if you make it to the top, uh, you got there on your own efforts, right? Yeah. Uh, What's very rarely talked about, uh, which is related to the cherry point, is the other side to this, which is if you don't make it to the top, which, as you pointed out, is going to be most people, right? Most people don't win in a competition. Uh, that means you fail because you suck, right? Uh, yeah. You're just not good enough. You're a failure. Uh, and it's not just that you failed. It's that you're, to use a good Trumpist term, a loser, right? Uh, so you're where you belong to be, right? Uh, and what you see in these circumstances then uh, is a psychological tendency on the part of the rich to believe that we're in a meritocracy. So they owe nothing to the people at the bottom because they got to where they got to because they worked way harder than everyone else. Uh, and far more insidious to my mind is the fact that you'll see a lot of people who are desperately poor, or desperately needy, uh, who are made to feel, and I want to stress again, made to feel that this is their fault, right? That they are losers and that's why they are where they are. Uh, and this is the kind of most noxious feature uh, of meritocratic ideology. It's the fact that it's intended to make most of us feel like losers, right? Uh, and we should reject that idea emphatically, right? Uh, now, there are other dimensions to the critique of meritocracy that we could talk to, but that's the one I just want to foreground right now, because uh, it connects, I think, to this charity uh, talk we had about earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, charity is kind of just, uh, if you so choose to be generous, um, and hand the poor a little bit of what they don't deserve or something like that. That's kind of some ultimate benevolent uh, wealthy person kind of belief. Yeah, there was a really good quote in Citizen Kane uh, by flawed character, right? Where, um, you know, uh, the guy told Kane that uh, you, you always like to talk a lot about the working man uh, as long as, as he's willing to receive something from you as your gift rather than as his right. Uh, things are going to yeah. be very different uh, when he starts saying, you know, fuck you, you know. I want that uh, guaranteed to me on a permanent basis as my right. Uh, and that's because it's very difficult to feel magnanimous uh, about being a better person um, when people are saying that, you know, the reason you got where you got to is because there are immense structural factors at play uh, that benefited you uh, in ways that have very little to do with your own efforts uh, and inhibited others uh, in ways, again, that also have very little to do with their own efforts. Uh, and so that's what we need to change. Yeah. Um, so it's been a great conversation, but we're getting about to the hour mark. Um, so do you have anything, uh, I guess, social media wise, podcast wise, content wise, um, you want to promote, I guess? Sure. Thanks. Uh, so I'm a member of the Plastic Pills podcast. Um, people can check us out. We record most weeks um, and we do critical theory and a bunch of other things. Um, I also have a new book that's coming out soon, uh, The Emergence of Postmodernity. Uh, in liberalism, secularism, uh, and capitalism. Uh, that's with Al Gray McMillan. Uh, and I'm writing a new book right now uh, for kind of in keeping with our conversation. It's for Rutledge Press. Uh, yeah. It's a critical history uh, of conservative intellectuals, uh, kind of going from Aristotle all the way down to uh, people like Patrick Nemean and Jordan Peterson. So oh, wow, that's, that's not so... done yet, but it'll, it'll be out soon enough and people can have a look at uh, that when it comes. <laughs> How big is that uh, expected to be? It's going to be a big fucking book, man. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I have a few Rutledge books and they're all, they're all mostly gigantic. Um, but uh, yeah, I've watched some Plastic Pills content. I'm, I mainly stay to the YouTube if those are, those are associated, right? Uh, yeah, that's uh, done with Plastic Pills. Uh, he does his YouTube channel. Uh, I think I cameo on one of them, <laughs> but for the most part, that's pretty independent of the podcast uh, where there are four of us and yeah. we all kind of do our thing. But it, it, it's generally great content. Go check them out. Um, the a link to the podcast will be down in the description. Um, if you want, the link to your Twitter will also be in the description, um, as well Thanks. as their YouTube channel. Um, thank you. This was an amazing conversation. And thank you for everyone for uh, listening or watching. <laughs>